I'm not playing with Hallmark ornaments like they're dolls. Welcome to Teacup for One. <laughs> My name is Matt and I have two degrees and welcome to the start of the wonderful Wizard of Oz month. After seeing how much fun we had with the Great Movie Ride Marathon a couple of weeks ago, I figured it was time to do another Teacup Movie Marathon. But after seeing how much everyone loved talking about The Wizard of Oz, and not just the 1939 film, but just all things Oz, I decided that our next movie marathon would be about all things Oz. So just like the great movie ride marathon, every week I will be hosting a live show right here on the channel to discuss a different Oz-inspired film, and I will be putting out a video inspired by each one of those films, except for Muppet Wizard of Oz. What do these do? <laughs> Nothing, they're my nipples. I mean, technically, Oz Week started last week with Muppet Wizard of Oz, and we did do the live show, and we had a very entertaining discussion about it, but I refuse to let my first video about the Muppets on this channel be about that film, movie. You know what? No, I'm just gonna call it for what it is. Monstrosity. So if, if you wanna hear what I think about Muppet Wizard of Oz, just Watch last week's live stream. It was very entertaining. But this week, we are moving into the Oz films that are actually good, or at the very least, not bad. And our film for this week is Sam Raimi's 2013 Oz the Great and Powerful, starring Rachel Weiss, Mila Kunis, Michelle Williams, Zach Braff. And I should reluctantly acknowledge that James Franco is in the movie as the title character, but as far as I'm concerned, he's the one thing that's keeping the movie from being great and powerful but if you want to hear my full thoughts on oz the great and powerful make sure that you tune in for the live show i'm going to be joined by some extra special guests who are participating in the collaboration for this week those guests are going to include lauren from castles capes and clones morgan from teaching disney kaylee hopkins and our favorite disney instagrammer Jeanette, aka tinker j787 make sure you check out all of their youtube channels and instagram profiles if you haven't already because they're going to put out some amazing content not just about oz the great and powerful but just in general they're some of my favorite people so check them out now one of the things that i found most interesting about oz the great and powerful is that it turned the wicked witch of the east into a fully realized, not dead character. I mean, really, the Wicked Witch of the East has to be one of the most famous corpses in all of film and literary history. Seriously, like, she has the most famous feat ever. But otherwise, she's a character that's really existed in the shadows of, you know, the more popular Witches of Oz. And she's really always been kind of a backseat character until recently. So for today's video, we are going to be looking at the evolution of the Wicked Witch of the East. Now, like all of our favorite Oz characters, the Wicked Witch of the East was originally introduced in L. Frank Baum's 1900 novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And she serves the purpose you would expect. She's crushed by a house and dies, and then they grave rob her shoes. You know, during his lifetime, L. Frank Baum wrote 14 Oz novels, and the official canon has been carried on by other authors since his death. But none of them have really elaborated on the backstory or the character of the Wicked Witch of the East. This is what we know about the Wicked Witch of the East, purely based on the original Oz novels. First and most famously, she was the original owner of the magical silver slippers that ended up going to Dorothy. Next, she controlled and terrorized Munchkinland, but unlike the Wicked Witch of the West who lived in a big, flashy castle, the Wicked Witch of the East lived in a much smaller, more modest cottage, kind of in line with what you would expect from a more traditional Brothers Grimm fairy tale witch, except it wasn't made of candy. I don't think. And what I think is most interesting is that she was a witch available for hire. Yeah, so she would exchange her magic for goods and services. And this is most notoriously how Nick Chopper came to become the Tin Man. But I did an entire video about that. It's actually a very good video, but no one's watched it. If, if you want to, there's a link. 
Now, like most things Oz related, the character has really been shaped by the 1939 MGM film. I mean, that movie is one of the most influential movies of all time, but especially when it comes to what people think of when they think of Oz. The character designs from MGM's film are so ingrained into our social consciousness just as what those characters are meant to look like, but when it comes to the Wicked Witch of the East, it's still kind of a question mark. Now, there is a long-standing Wizard of Oz fan theory that I absolutely love that says that the witch that Dorothy sees Miss Gulch transform into during the Cyclone scene is actually the Wicked Witch of the East, with some people pointing out that her shoes are flickering, shimmering. You know, they could be ruby, but who knows? It's in sepia tone. Sapia tone, black and white. There's no color. And this fan theory was kind of confirmed by a piece of artwork that I'm almost positive was commissioned by Time Warner. Now, I don't know this for a fact, so I can't say for sure if it is Wizard of Oz canon. But in this piece of art, it depicts all the characters that we see during the cyclone scene, and the witch is wearing the Wicked Witch of the East's trademark stockings and ruby slippers. But again, I, I can't confirm if this has been like approved by Warner Brothers, but if it has, it's canon. Now, if you're looking at that and thinking, which please, that doesn't count, that's just fan art. There is one depiction of the Wicked Witch of the East in an officially licensed Wizard of Oz game. Officially licensed, I'm pretty sure that means it was approved by Warner Brothers, and according to the rules of canon storytelling, that makes it Wizard of Oz canon. So there is a Wizard of Oz slot machine app that features one scene with the Wicked Witch of the East. And this is her. So she's pretty much a purple skinned version of the Wicked Witch of the West. Her costume has a similar design, but the striped motif of her socks carries on like throughout the costume, throughout the dress and the hat. And truth be told, I don't hate it. You know, considering what an important role Technicolor played in the original Wizard of Oz film, I think this character would have fit right in. But no matter what you choose to believe MGM's Wicked Witch of the East might have looked like, the fact remains that in the film, we only see her feet. But I wasn't joking. They have to be the most famous feet in film history. I mean, this movie came out over 80 years ago, and in the last six months alone, I've seen this image parodied in WandaVision and in Jungle Cruise. But pff, I digress. The 1939 film didn't give us much intel on the Wicked Witch of the East, but at the same time, it gave us a lot. And when I say that, I mean that it provided us a lot to build on for subsequent Oz adaptations, and all because of one word. Sister. Sister. Now, the movie only uses the word sister twice, and that relationship is never discussed or explored any further beyond that one scene. But what I find so genius about this decision is just by establishing that relationship between the Witch of the West and the Witch of the East, it ups the stakes in the story by, like, a million. Because, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West would have been terrifying enough just on her own going after Dorothy for the shoes. But the fact that Dorothy killed her sister, that makes it personal. And the fact that they don't delve into the relationship of the Wicked Sisters at all provides so many fascinating unanswered questions. Unanswered questions which have provided the foundation for some pretty amazing Oz adaptations over the past few decades. The first one that I want to look at is the film that inspired today's video, Oz the Great and Powerful. In the film, the Wicked Witch of the East is named Evanora and she's played by Rachel Weisz and she's portrayed as the older, more powerful sister of the Wicked Witch of the West. So she's the master manipulator who killed Glinda's father. She's the one who convinces her sister to give into wickedness and become the Wicked Witch of the West. She controls the flying monkeys. Honestly, Evanora is a much more powerful character than I ever would have expected for somebody who's killed by a house. Now, what I find really compelling about Oz the Great and Powerful is that it just gives us a taste of what it would be like to have the Wicked Sisters in full political power. And it really puts the original Oz story into a context where we understand why the idea of a wizard is essential to keeping some form of peace and order in the land of Oz. Because instead of the witches ruling everything, they can just be evil, corrupt local officials. But my personal favorite depiction of the Wicked Witch of the East is Wicked, 
where she's named Nessaros, and she's portrayed as the younger sister of the Wicked Witch of the West, Alphaba. Wicked the Musical is based on the novel of the same name by Gregory Maguire. And of course, like any good adaptation, there are some changes that are made to the character between the novel and the stage show. I think. I mean, I've only seen the musical, I haven't read the novel, but I read the Wikipedia page, so, like, I know what I'm talking about. In both the musical and the novel, Nessaros is born with some kind of disability. In the novel, she's born without arms, and in the musical, she's confined to a wheelchair. Now, in both stories, Alphaba, aka the Wicked Witch of the West, grows up as her caregiver. Nessaros' father gives her a pair of silver slippers, which in the musical eventually transform into ruby slippers after they're enchanted to help her walk unassisted, which is a beyond brilliant plot device to justify the discrepancy between the silver slippers in the books and the ruby slippers in the MGM film. So smart. Anyway, in both the musical and the novel, Nessaros' insecurities end up snowballing throughout her lifetime and lead her down a path where she eventually becomes the tyrannical ruler of Munchkinland and earns herself the title of the Wicked Witch of the East. Now again, I haven't read Wicked the novel, but in terms of the musical, in a lot of ways, Nessaros' story is my favorite part of the entire thing, at least in terms of Wicked as an Oz adaptation, because this is the thing. Nessaros' character arc delivers on the promise of Wicked's premise far better than what we see from Elphaba's story. I think Wicked is a beautiful musical, and I absolutely appreciate what they were doing with Elphaba's character in terms of having her go down a path where society portrays her as a villain instead of her actually becoming a villain and becoming the Wicked Witch that everyone thinks that she is. You know, it's kind of like what Maleficent was trying to do, but Wicked does it well. When it comes to these types of villain origin stories, I want to see the main character falling from grace by merit of their own choices. Not because society disagrees with them and then like besmears their name and paints them as a villain, and not because they're given a poison brainwashing apple, you know? Nessaros' story gave me what I wanted. Nessa's story is so simple but so effective. Bok, the munchkin, asks her out on a date in order to impress the girl that he's actually in love with, Glinda, but then that causes Nessa to develop this really tragic, unhealthy infatuation with him that eventually motivates her to take over Munchkin Land and then curse him by shrinking his heart so that he can't love anyone else besides her, and that causes him to become the Tin Man. And it is a brilliant character arc because she started out as such a sweet, sympathetic character. And yes, she ends up doing terrible things and absolutely earns the title of Wicked Witch of the East, but at the same time we understand why she's doing what she's doing and we see the tragedy in it. And she is the perfect bridge between the Oz mythology that we had in the novels and the Oz mythology created by the 1939 film. So she fits all the characteristics of the Wicked Witch of the East from the books, insofar as ruling Munchkinland and essentially creating the Tin Man, while at the same time giving us a little bit of an homage to the MGM Wicked Witch of the East once her silver slippers are enchanted and become ruby slippers. And next week's episode is going to be all about the slippers. But until then, friends, this concludes yet another episode of Teacup for One and the first official episode of the Teacup for One Oz Movie Marathon. Now, let me know in the comment section down below what version of the Wicked Witch of the East is your favorite. And if you want to be the first to know when I publish more videos for Oz Month or just more videos in general, they're usually about Disney, Shakespeare, Funkos, film, or cats, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. If you haven't subscribed already, it is super easy. All you have to do is click on my face. <laughs> Thanks for joining me again today, everyone. My name is Matt, and I have two degrees, and that's the tea cup for one. <sighs> I'll get you, my pretty. <laughs>